One of the things that's so important as a lawyer is that you have to know the definition of your terms. We spoke about this in a bunch of different other videos. When you're arguing to a jury and you're using legal terminology and the jury is supposed to understand that, you have to use, uh, you have to explain, you have to define your terms. And the same is true when you're talking to a judge. You have to define your terms. Don't just throw around legal terminology as though everyone knows what you're talking about. Sometimes you have to provide definitions for those legal terms. And a lot of times the legal definition of those terms are found in cases or statutes or treatises. And that's what you have to go to when you're trying to define certain terms. Well, there was a term used by the Indiana Supreme Court in the Richard Allen a petition for a writ of mandamus. Now let's just remember a little bit what happened here. We're going to jump into much more of the a deep dive into the facts in just one minute. But what happened here essentially, the 30,000 foot view, is that Andrew Baldwin and Brad Rossi were representing Richard Allen in the Delphi murder case. And the judge decided that they're, that they're ineffective and they're hopelessly gross negligent and he, that, that, uh, Richard Allen is not going to have a fair shot at a trial if these lawyers represent him. So therefore, she basically gave them an option. Either you, we can, I can publicly humiliate you or you'll just agree to withdraw. So that's what happened. And then they, did, they had second thoughts about that. And they filed a writ of mandamus with the Indiana Supreme Court. Now remember, this is the trial court level. Generally speaking, you have to go one level at a time. So when you have a trial court level, the next level is the Court of Appeals. The level after that is the Supreme Court. But here, what they did is they jumped the levels. They jumped the level of the Court of Appeals and went straight to the, to the Indiana Supreme Court with a writ of mandamus. They had a petition. They wanted something called a writ of mandamus. What is that? So we explained this in other videos, but if you haven't seen those videos, then let me just explain it to you now, even though you certainly should. And if you haven't yet, you got to start binge watching all the videos on Brother Counsel and you become like one of my other very intelligent viewers and subscribers of this channel. And by the way, if you haven't yet, please subscribe, like the video, and so we can help us continue to bring this message to you and to others. So what is a writ of mandamus? A writ of mandamus is something that you learn usually in the first year of law school in constitutional law. It's when you ask the Supreme Court to tell another court what to do. So it's not a nor it's not a regular petition that you file. It's for special circumstances. And in this situation, they argued, and this was part of the arguments that were going back and forth between the special judge, the state and the, the appellate attorneys for Richard Allen about whether the, the Indiana Supreme Court should even hear this petition because, as we're going to see, the only time that you're able to ask the Indiana Supreme Court to get involved is if there's something that needs the attention immediately and there's no other way to go about this. And if you don't do this now, if you don't correct the wrong that's happening now, it can cause a lot of prejudice, it can cause a lot of wasted time and resources, and therefore you're able, that's, that's the way in, that's the way to skip the line, so to speak, to skip the level of the Court of Appeals and get into the Indiana Supreme Court. So they asked the Indiana Supreme Court to tell the trial court, tell this special judge that she is not allowed to uh, just dismiss these two attorneys and that the Indiana Supreme Court should reinstate Andrew Baldwin and Brad Rossi as Richard Allen's attorneys. Now, this gets to where I started off the video, and that is that we have to understand certain terms. And one of the terms that the Indiana Supreme Court used in its order in January 18th, so let's just remember, we're, we're right now in February, but in January 18th, about three weeks ago, the Indiana Supreme Court issued a very short opinion in which they said, we're going to grant in part and deny in part this petition for writ of mandamus. And that's because they asked the, the Richard Allen's appellate attorneys asked for three specific things. One of them was to reinstate, uh, reinstate Andrew Baldwin and Brad Rossi as his attorneys. And that the Indiana Supreme Court said, yes, we're going to grant that part and therefore they're reinstated. But in that opinion, they said, we will promptly issue an opinion. So they just, that was just the order saying, this is what you guys have to do. But then they said, we're going to promptly issue an opinion. And I was wondering, and maybe you were also when you were watching these videos, 
I wonder what promptly means. Does promptly mean tomorrow? Does promptly mean in a few hours? What does promptly mean to the Indiana Supreme Court? Well, here we go. Now we have the definition of promptly because now this is three weeks later when they issued this opinion. This opinion came out, stamped February 8th, 2024. So now we understand we have solid proof that to the Indiana Supreme Court, promptly means with, uh, within three weeks or <laughs> at most three weeks, right? So you have at least three weeks from, I'm sorry, you have at least three weeks to what's considered promptly in the Indiana Supreme Court. Okay, so now let's jump into the actual substance of what, what went on over here. So let's just remind ourselves a little bit of the facts of the case, and then we'll jump into the legal analysis, which is actually going to be very exciting, especially for all you law nerds. We're going to explain it all, explain the Sixth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment, Fifth Amendment. This is going to be just this is going to be so much fun. So let's just first get into the facts a little bit. The state charged Richard Allen with two counts of murder. Because he couldn't afford an attorney, and this is taken straight out of the opinion, because he couldn't afford an attorney, the trial, a trial court appointed public defenders Andrew Baldwin and Brad Rousey to represent him. But after about a year, the special judge presiding over the case became concerned they were not representing Allen effectively. So she disqualified them over Allen's objection. Remember, Allen, Richard Allen, did not want the judge to dismiss these attorneys. He liked these attorneys and he wanted to work with these attorneys and he wanted these attorneys to represent him. So he objected to what the, this special judge was doing, but still the judge didn't care and um, the, uh, she disqualified them. And she replaced them with two new public defenders. And then what she did is she said, well, this, the, the trial was supposed to already occur in January, uh, but now that we have two brand new attorneys to the case, so she adjourned the case essentially for nine months. So now that the new trial attorneys would have enough time to prepare. So now what happened? Allen then retained two appellate attorneys who filed a verified petition for writ of mandamus in our court requesting that we mandate three things. So they requested three things. Number one, they were, the, the request was for Baldwin and Razi to be reinstated as court-appointed court counsel. Number two, that Allen's criminal trial begin within 70 days after we issue the writ. So they want this trial already going. The trial was supposed to begin in January 2024, and now, it's, now the judge pushed it off for nine months. So now they're asking, so number one, we should be reinstated as counsel. That's, that's again, Andrew Baldwin and Brad Razi. And number two is that we want the trial date set right away, 70 days. And number three, they asked that a new special judge replace the current special judge. And that argument was that this special, job, special, special judge obviously has bias against these attorneys. So that was the three requests that they, that the Richard Allen essentially made of the, with his appellate counsel, through his appellate counsel, this was the three requests that they made in their petition for writ of mandamus. So here we go. This is when the court is just, again, giving you a little bit more of the facts and the procedural history, and then we're going to jump into the actual, uh, actual analysis of the law as it applies to this, these three requests and see which of these three requests they grant, which ones they don't grant, and why. Most importantly, why? Because that's what we all want to know. Here, we don't want, just want to know what, we want to know why. So, in February 2017, Two teenage girls, Abigail Williams and Liberty German, were killed in Delphi, Indiana. Five years later, in October 2022, Allen was arrested and charged with murdering them. The trial court judge transferred Allen to the Department of Corrections for his safety while he awaits trial and then recused from the case. So the judge, all that first judge did was transfer Allen to the uh, Department of Corrections for his safety and then he said, I'm recusing myself and you have to appoint a different judge. Well, they did appoint another judge. A special judge was then appointed, and because Allen couldn't afford an attorney, the judge appointed Baldwin and Razi to represent him at public expense, right? This is the public defender's office. But a year later, the special judge lost faith in their ability to assist Allen with his defense effectively, so she ultimately disqualified them as counsel. A leak of confidential case materials, including crime scene photos, triggered the disqualification. Now remember, there was a leak. What happened? The following. Baldwin and Razi represent that in August 2023, one of Baldwin's friends 
and former employees Mitchell Westerman visited Baldwin's office, secretly copied discovery materials, including crime scene photos, and distributed them to others. After discovering the leak, Baldwin and Rossi notified the special judge and the prosecutor on October 6th. They also explained that after Westerman told Baldwin on October 9th what he had done, Baldwin and Rossi relayed that information to the prosecutor the next day. So as soon as they're relaying everything essentially right away. Then we essentially, we're going to skip a little bit, then we had this, this hearing. And at the hearing, that's when the judge said, okay, first she said, don't do any more work on this case, you guys, Baldwin and Rossi, don't do any more case. We're going to have this special hearing. And before the hearing, remember, she invited all the camera crews in there. And then she had a special meeting in her chambers. So nobody was able to see this except she did have a court reporter there. And in that meeting, the judge, the special judge, informed Baldwin and Rossi that they had demonstrated gross negligence and incompetence. And we explained this all in our last video uh, on the Delphi, actually two videos ago on the Delphi uh, murder case with Richard Allen. Uh, we explained why, whether this was actually gross negligence or not, but this is what the special judge said, that because they demonstrated gross negligence and incompetence, she had grave concerns about their representation of Allen. And she offered them two choices. Either you guys bow out respectfully, quietly, and then I won't publicly shame you, or I'm going to publicly publicly shame you in front of all these cameras. So that was essentially the choice. And listen to how the Indiana Supreme Court explains that choice. Since the court presented to Baldwin and Rossi what seemed like a Hobson's choice, withdraw or be disqualified in a public publicly humiliating fashion, they conveyed they would withdraw over Allen's objection to the court's disqualification decision. So basically, what's the Hobson's choice? Hobson's choice is when it looks like I'm giving you an option, but I'm not giving you an option. So here it looks, yeah, you have two options. Either you can just withdraw quietly and I won't publicly humiliate you, or I'm going to get on the record in front of all the cameras and publicly humiliate you. Do you really have a choice? No, you don't really have a choice. So that's what Hobson's choice is referring to. So the Indiana Supreme Court agrees that this is a Hobson's choice type of scenario, and that's why Baldwin and Razi said, okay, they're just going to withdraw from the case and don't publicly, and the, the judge shouldn't publicly humiliate them. Well, after that, they refused to file a, with a, a withdrawal or a motion to withdraw with this court, and then they said, no, we still want on on the case, and that's what eventually led to the the judge, the special judge saying, no, I'm disqualifying you. You're out. I'm not allowing you to try this case. Whether you file the motion to withdraw or not, you are out. I'm not letting you. And then they filed, even after she then appointed two new public defenders to represent Richard Allen, then Baldwin and Razi filed a, an appearance anyway, pro bono, meaning, okay, we're not going to be on behalf of the public defender's office. We're just going to be there as like his hired private counsel, but they're doing it pro bono. And still the judge says, no, I'm not allowing you guys in. You're not allowed to do anything in my courtroom. Get out. And that's what led to this petition for a writ of mandamus. So the first issue that the, the Indiana Supreme Court deals with is whether they can even hear this case, whether they can even hear this petition. And it's just a procedural question whether they're actually allowed to even hear this. Because again, remember, they're skipping the stages here. They're skipping the, the Court of Appeals and there's, they're, they're going straight to the Indiana Supreme Court. So you, there has to be extraordinary circumstances, which they do find. So we're not going to go through all the case law about that. Essentially, all you have to know is that the Indiana Supreme Court said, yes, you got over the procedural hump and now we're actually going to hear the case on the merits. And that's what everybody wants to see usually anyway. You don't want to get out of it by some sort of procedural defect. So gets to the merits of the case. So here we go. Everybody understands that there's a Sixth Amendment right. Every defendant, any, every criminal defendant has the right to, a Sixth Amendment right to effective assistance of counsel. Actually, assistance of counsel, which again, the, court, the case law has said, also really includes effective assistance of counsel. So you are entitled under the Sixth Amendment to effective assistance of counsel. And then there's also further case law that for defendants who can afford to hire an attorney 
or retain an attorney to represent them for free, that constitutional guarantee includes the right to choose which attorney will represent them. So the Sixth Amendment right just says that you have the right to, account, to have counsel present. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you can choose your counsel. Who says you get to choose your counsel? That's the next step. So here, the courts have said that this is a United States Supreme Court case that says that if the defendant can hire an attorney, if they can hire an attorney, then they do get to choose. And the judge can't say, nope, we don't like those attorneys. We're going to give you other attorneys. No. If you have the means and you want to hire specific attorneys, then you also have that right to hire an attorney. Now, also here is that if an attorney agrees to represent them for free. Now, remember, in this case, aside from Baldwin and Razi being appointed by the public defender's office, which they were going to get paid for, but they also, even once, even once they were dis disqualified by this judge, they entered an appearance pro bono, saying we're going to do it for free. So this would also trigger, would seem to also trigger this right that if they're going to do it for free, then they should, then Richard Allen does have the right to choose which attorneys. Now, continuing, let's just uh, pretend for a minute that he actually, they actually did not enter an appearance and to appear pro bono. Let's just assume that they didn't do that. So they're going to, the, the Indiana Supreme Court continues with this analysis as though these two attorneys were just uh, appointed and now there's other attorneys that the judge wants to appoint instead. Now listen to this. But the right to counsel of choice does not extend to criminal defendants who can't afford an attorney. So if you're a criminal defendant and you can't afford an attorney, you can't choose the greatest attorney in America to come represent you because he's busy doing YouTube channels like this. So you can't just drag any attorney out and say, well, I have a Sixth Amendment right and I get to choose whichever attorney I want. No, if you're not going to hire them and you're relying on the state to hire uh, to hire your attorneys, then you can't choose which attorney. Now, listen to this. Allen can't afford an attorney, and he has asked us to reinstate Baldwin and Razi as a court-appointed court counsel. So here we have a situation. Richard Allen cannot afford an attorney, and now he's asking us that he wants to still choose Baldwin and Razi. So that would seem to say, wait, there's no right. There's no Sixth Amendment right, and there's no right under this last case that we, that we cited, the United States Supreme Court, which also said that if you hire an attorney, then you can choose the attorney. But if you're indigent, you don't have enough money, so then you can't. Consequently, the Indiana Supreme Court says the following. He has no constitutional right to choose which attorney will represent him. But, listen to this. You're going to love this. But he didn't choose Baldwin and Razi. Hold on a minute. So the, the Indiana Supreme Court says the following. Wait a minute. Here, he didn't choose these attorneys. Who chose these attorneys? The trial court, this special judge. The trial court did. Allen just wants to continue with the attorneys the trial court chose for him. So therefore, they're separating this. They're making a distinction. They're saying this is not the same as Richard Allen saying, I want specific attorneys to represent me. That's not what happened here. The trial court appointed these attorneys to him and they've been representing him for a while. And now the court wants to say, you know what? Let's swap attorneys. Now that's a different issue. That's an issue which the Indiana Supreme Court says is not like the initial choice of which attorneys you want. Actually, it's something else. Allen just wants to continue with the attorneys the trial court chose for him. He is insisting on the continuity of counsel rather than his choice of counsel. So a very important distinction. This is not the same as just choosing whichever lawyer you want. This is you want to continue with the choice that the trial court made for you, the choice that the judge made for you. That's all you're asking for. You want the right of continuity, not the right to choose. So even though we just made this distinction that it depends, if you're paying money, if you're a paying client, then you get to choose under the Sixth Amendment, which attorney you want to represent them, represent you. And if you are, if you do not have the money, then you cannot choose that attorney and you just have to deal with whatever the trial court gives you. But if you've been already rep been represented by these attorneys, by the trial court, and now you just want to continue, that's a different issue. And now they analyze this issue. Okay, so now we have to analyze a new issue. Is this right of continuity, is that a guaranteed right? So they continue like this. Courts around the country are divided 
over whether the Sixth Amendment guarantees criminal defendants the continuity of court-appointed counsel. So you're not the only one wondering at home watching this that I wonder what the courts have held because this is, a, this is an issue that has divided the courts. They're not sure themselves whether different, depends on which jurisdiction, which court you're in, whether the, the issue of continuity of counsel is a right within the Sixth Amendment. Our court, now they quote a, oh, we're going to get to that in a second. Okay, I'm sorry. Our court has been generally of the view that a trial court is limited in its authority to remove a criminal defendant's court-appointed counsel. So we are in the general view, meaning this is even still in, in, in Indiana, that they're generally in the view that a trial court is limited in its authority to remove a criminal defendant's court-appointed counsel. Once they appointed those counsel, you're very limited as a court to remove those, those uh, attorneys. And that's, that's, the, uh, that's the law. And even courts that have concluded there is no Sixth Amendment right to the continuity of court-appointed counsel have agreed with that much. That even if it's not a guaranteed right under the Sixth Amendment, still, a trial court is still limited in their ability to replace what they already, the, with the counsel that they already appointed to you. So now, then they quote a Colorado Supreme Court. They quote the following from the Colorado Supreme Court. For example, though the Colorado Supreme Court recently held there is no Sixth Amendment right to the continuity of court-appointed counsel, so here they're saying like this. Number one, the jurisdictions are split about whether the continuity of counsel is a guaranteed right under the Sixth Amendment or not. So that's issue number one. But even in the jurisdictions which hold that continuity of counsel is not a right under the Sixth Amendment, still the ability of a trial court to remove the already court-appointed court counsel is very limited. So for example, Colorado, they do not say that, this, that the right of continuity of counsel is guaranteed in the Sixth Amendment. They do not say that. Yet, they say the following. Even though they held that there is no Sixth Amendment right to the continuity of court-appointed counsel, it's still acknowledged that a defendant's interest in continued representation by a lawyer they have been working with is entitled to great weight. So the fact that we've been preparing this case for trial, think about it. You've been working with this attorney as a criminal defendant. You've been working with these attorneys for a year preparing your case for trial. Now all of a sudden the trial court is going to say, you know what, let's give somebody else a shot here. Let's give some other attorney a shot here to, to try this case. No, that interest that the defendant has to keep that counsel that they've been working on and strategizing with and going over the evidence with, that interest has great weight. If they can demonstrate that prejudice would result from substitution with a different court-appointed court attorney. So if it's, they can demonstrate that by just having a new attorney come in at the 11th hour is going to prejudice the defendant, then you can't just do that. The court concluded, now listen to this, this is where it gets even funner. Can you imagine? Can you imagine it getting any funner already than we're already talking about the right of continuity of counsel, the right of choice of counsel in the Sixth Amendment? I mean, can it get any funner than this? And the answer is yes, it's about to. So here we go. Because here we have the Colorado Supreme Court that says, that there is no Sixth Amendment right of continuity of counsel. But if you have if the but the defendant has an interest to work with the same attorneys that were appointed to him already, and he's been they they've he has this very, very heavy weight, this this weight, this interest is a very has a great weight. And it's gonna prejudice him otherwise to just remove these counsel. The court says the following: this is the court in Colorado. Colorado. The court concluded that interest flows from the due process guarantees in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments to the U.S. Constitution rather than the Sixth Amendment right to counsel. So in case you think that, okay, at least all I have to concentrate is, is on the Sixth Amendment. No, you've always got to think about the other amendments also. So you have the due process, the due process rights of a defendant guaranteed under the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment. So therefore, it affects his due process rights. That's the problem here. The problem with, with taking away his counsel that he's been working with for the past year and at the 11th hour 
putting in new counsel, that infringes on his Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments, not necessarily a Sixth Amendment. As we explained, Colorado doesn't even say that the right to continuity of counsel is in the Sixth Amendment. It's not. But it will fall within the due process rights of your Fifth and Fourteenth rights, uh, the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments rights that you have. That's what it will fall under because it's taking away his due process. It's not fair for him. He has he should have due process now that he'd be able to work with the attorneys that he's been working with the past year or two. And while the U.S. Supreme Court has not yet addressed whether there is a Sixth Amendment right to the continuity of court-appointed counsel, it too, so even the United States Supreme Court, it has not addressed this issue, whether continuity of counsel is in the Sixth Amendment, but it too has recognized that the rights to due process and counsel overlap. And this is how they overlap. So you have the Sixth Amendment, and you also have to think about the other amendments. Are there any other amendments that are overlapping with these rights? So even if you're just concentrating on the Sixth Amendment, you can't forget about the due process rights of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment. And that is what they're saying here. And then, so this is what the Indiana Supreme Court is saying, that they like this Colorado Supreme Court opinion. And therefore, they're going to say that you can't just dismiss another these attorneys. But you could sometimes dismiss them if they're completely ineffective, if they're completely incompetent, if they're completely gross negligent. Even if you've been working with these attorneys for three years, who cares? If they're completely incompetent, you still have the right to effective assistance of counsel. So then they say the following. The Colorado Supreme Court also recognized that before disqualifying court-appointed court counsel, the court must determine that any remedy short of disqualification would be ineffective. Meaning, is there anything else that we can do if there's some reason that the trial court feels that these attorneys just really don't know what they're doing? But if there's some way to remedy that short of disqualification, then you've got to, ex you've got to explore that avenue first. And therefore, they're saying, in other words, disqualifying court-appointed counsel is a drastic remedy that should only be a last resort. And then the, the Supreme Court continues to go on and they say that disqualification over here was not a last resort. And they go through some of the issues that the judge had. So you have to, now that we've explained some of the law, so now they have to apply the situation to, to the law that we just explained. So what was the situation? The judge had specific issues that she had with Andrew Baldwin and Brad Rossi. So now the court, what the Indiana Supreme Court is saying, okay, now we've explained the law. This is how we understand the law. This is how we want to apply the law in Indiana. Well, now let's see if this maybe is a last resort. Maybe they're just so incredibly gross negligent and so incompetent that maybe that's what we have to do. So they take, they take the issues that the special judge had. And here we go. The special judge concluded Baldwin and Rossi made four mistakes. There's four mistakes that they made which convinced this judge that they're completely incompetent and grossly negligent, and therefore the last resort is for them to be disqualified. The special judge concluded Baldwin and Rossi made four mistakes that demonstrated they may be unable to assist Allen with his defense effectively. Number one, they failed to secure confidential case materials, including crime scene photos. So remember, they let that uh, Mitchell into their uh, car, into their office, and he went to the conference room and took some pictures and disseminated the pictures. So that was that was strike number one. Number two, Baldwin misdirected an email. Remember, there's an email that he sent to the wrong address and which also had sensitive materials, so confidential case materials, and that was the second strike that she had against these attorneys. Number three, Baldwin and Razi made extrajudicial statements while the prosecutor's motion for a gag order was pending. Remember, this was not this was before the gag order was put into place. So they made some statements out of court, extrajudicial statements, while the prosecutor's motion for gag order was pending. Four, statements in Baldwin and Razi's motion to reconsider safekeeping order turned out to be wrong. So that was also some argument that the judge made was that some of the statements that Baldwin and Razi put into their motion or briefing were, were not accurate. Okay, so now, but, so this is now the Indiana Supreme Court addressing, starting to address some of those issues and are, are these four issues so terrible and that there's no other resort is there any, there's no other resort but to disqualify these attorneys. So they say the following, the Indiana Supreme Court now. 
but the record does not reflect the special judge disqualified counsel only as a last resort after balancing her effective assistance of counsel concerns against the prejudice to Allen that would result from substituting counsel. First, the record does not reflect that disqualifying counsel was a last resort. There's just there was no record that showed that she went through all the different options that she can think of and nothing would be sufficient and therefore she had to disqualify them. Each of the special judge's four concerns could be addressed through a combination of procedural rules and court orders, including the gag order and protective order she entered. So she's saying, what? What's the problem? You're afraid that they're making extrajudicial statements? Okay, so you'll enter the gag order. And now that the gag order is in place, so now they can't talk outside of the courtroom. And you can also have other procedural orders entered. And they say, and trial courts maintain both statutory and inherent authority to compel compliance with their orders, right? They have the authority to enforce their orders. That's number one. Second, the only basis for disqualifying counsel was the special judge's concern that they could not assist Allen with his defense effectively, right? That was her concern. Her concern really this was her basis, and this is what she reiterated a number of times, is that her basis for disqualifying Baldwin and Razi was because she felt that they could that they are so incompetent that they can't effectively assist Allen with his defense. To be sure, the Sixth Amendment's right to effective counsel imposes a baseline requirement of competence on whatever lawyer is chosen or appointed. So the Sixth Amendment right to effective assistance of counsel, there has to be a baseline requirement. I mean, you have to have some basic knowledge of the law. You can't get a lawyer who doesn't even, never even heard of the rules of evidence and get him in there and say, well, you're a lawyer, you've been practicing for 20 years, so get up there and try this case. Now you can't, there has to be a baseline. There has to be some familiarity with the rules of evidence, some familiarity, familiarity with the criminal procedure, the rules of criminal procedure. They, they have to have some familiarity. There has to be a baseline. So they're laying out that, okay, you're right, there has to be a baseline. But there is no suggestion that Baldwin and Razi are out of their depth. There's no suggestion that they're out of their depth, that, that they don't even meet the baseline requirements. Just the opposite. Baldwin has over 30 years of experience representing thousands of clients around the state, including clients charged with murder, rape, robbery, burglary, and other violent offenses, and has tried more than 125 jury trials. So Baldwin has tried 125 jury trials. That is impressive. Many lawyers, probably most lawyers, haven't even tried that many. Razi has over 20 years of the same experience, including three murder trials and a previous certification to handle death penalty cases. So he got a special certification showing that he must really be good enough, meet the baseline, because now he's able, he has a certification to represent people, the defendants, which are facing the death penalty. So there's no, the, the Indiana Supreme Court is saying here, there's no suggestion here, there, there just isn't that Baldwin and Razi don't even meet the baseline requirements to effective assistance of counsel. And this was the main concern of the special judge, that they're so, so incredibly incompetent that they, they don't even meet the baseline requirement for effective assistance, assistance of counsel, which is guaranteed under the Sixth Amendment. Moreover, neither the state nor the special judge argue that counsel's extrajudicial statements or the statements in their motion harmed Allen's defense. So their, their extra statements that they made they didn't harm Allen's defense. Their statements that they made outside of court before the gag order was even entered into, how did that affect his defense? It didn't. There's no, there is no, there is no um, suggestion that it did. They do argue the disclosure of case materials undermines Allen's defense, but they don't explain how. So here you have... Right, the judge, the special judge, is arguing against these Richard Allen's appellate attorneys because she wants, she doesn't want these attorneys part of the case, and the state is also arguing against them. And their part of their argument is is that by Baldwin and Razi giving those extra judicial statements, it is it undermines Allen's defense. So they make that argument, but they don't explain how. You can't just tell them, well, it's undermining his defense. How? Why don't you explain to the Indiana Supreme Court how it's undermining their defense? But they don't do that. The special judge doesn't do that, and neither does the state. So the Indiana Supreme Court is saying, okay, great, you're making these conclusory statements or arguments, but you're not showing us how. And they don't argue these mistakes reflect 
that Baldwin and Razi are incompetent to handle Allen's defense or explain why Dell's disqualification is necessary to protect Allen's right to the effective assistance of counsel. Notably, and here is where also, this is just like the, the hammer, the last nail on the, in, in the casket. Notably, neither the state nor the special judge direct us to any case concluding that issues like these, either in, in isolation or combination, meaning these issues, these four issues that the judge had, they don't cite any case that shows us that any of these issues in isolation, meaning, meaning by themselves, or in combination with other issues, or in combination of these four issues, rendered counsel constitutionally ineffective or was sufficient to warrant disqualification. And remember, this is what we always talk about in these videos, is that if you're going to make an argument to any court, you've got to have a basis in the law. You've got to show the judges why the law tells you that what I'm arguing to you is right. You've got to do that. And they didn't do that. They said there's no, they didn't cite any case law that says that these, these issues that the judge had amounts to disqualification. That was number two. So that was the, um, why disqualification is not appropriate. So they gave one, then they gave the second one, and now we get into the third one. Third, there is no showing that the special judge's concern outweighed the substantial prejudice to Allen from substituting counsel. Remember, there is a very great interest, which we spoke about earlier. There is a great interest to a defendant to, con to continue with the counsel that he's been preparing the trial with for the past year and a half. There's a very strong interest. And only if you show substantial prejudice to Allen is that interest going to be outweighed. And again, they're saying there's no showing that the special judge's concerns outweighed the substantial prejudice to Allen from substituting counsel. Baldwin and Rezzi spent, spent over a year working with Allen, investigators and experts developing Allen's defense, and Allen says he is ready to present it to a jury. The prejudice to Allen begins with the fact that information and momentum spillage is inevitable as one trial team handles hands a complicated case like this over to another. Meaning the prejudice, there's going to be prejudice because I can't, as an attorney, I'm giving my case over to another attorney to try, right? I'm ready to try this case and I have all of my strategies in my head. I'm all ready. And as much, I can sit with you for a week straight but I'm not, there's going to be what they call spillage. There's going to be that I'm not able to give you everything. I'm just not. I've been living this case for a year and I just, I can't give you every thought. Whenever I see a different document, I'm going to have another 20 thoughts. I can't possibly share that all with the new counsel stepping in. So I just, I love the way they say this. The prejudice to Alan begins with the fact that information and momentum spillage is inevitable as one trial team hands a complicated case like this over to another. Add to that, add to that another reason of prejudice. Allen has already been in jail for about a year and a half now. See, this is a person who's completely innocent right now, right? He has a presumption of innocence. And he's been sitting in jail for a year and a half. And substituting counsel requires a nine-month delay. So now he's going to have to sit in jail for another nine months in the trial. That with substitute counsel, unsure whether they would even be ready by then. And then these new counsel are saying they don't even know if that's going to be enough time. They only have nine months to get ready. They don't even know that's going to be enough time. That is not surprising given that this is a complicated high stakes case. Okay, further, it has already been seven years since the murder and it's already been seven years since the murder and fact finding only gets harder as time passes. So another reason why it's going to prejudice because it's going to be harder. Memories fade, evidence is lost. So the longer that this drags out, the more prejudice it's going to have against Richard Allen. So that's the thing. They're saying there's just tremendous, tremendous amount of prejudice to Allen, to Richard Allen, by substituting now other attorneys into this case. Then um, is not enough. There's not. There's just the, your the special judge's concerns are just not enough that weighs against this prejudice that would that Richard Allen would suffer. Okay. So that is why. Now we got the why. We knew the what on January eighth. And now, January 18th, I'm sorry, and now we know the why about why the Indiana Supreme Court said, no, we are reinstating Baldwin and Razi to uh, be Richard Allen's attorneys, and they now can take the place, and they can get paid also, by the way. They don't have to do a pro bono now. 
All right, now there's two other requests. Remember, there's two other requests. The second request in this writ, uh, this petition for a writ of mandamus, love saying that, is that um, number two is that they wanted the trial, to, the trial to be ordered to happen within 70 days. And then they say the following. This is what the Indiana Supreme Court says. Allen's second request, second request is that we mandate that the trial court order Allen's trial to commence within 70 days. Allen and his attorneys prepared and signed a speedy trial motion. So, right, you, you want a motion for a speedy trial for Richard Allen? And they prepared this motion. They signed it. But they never filed it. So you never filed it. They never filed it with the trial court. So... Until a trial court has refused to rule properly, there's no basis for relief in this court. I mean, the, the Supreme Court cannot do anything unless the trial court made a ruling that was wrong. Here, there's no ruling because the motion was never filed. So therefore, there's nothing that the Supreme Court can do here, and therefore they're saying, well, we can't grant this because it was never filed, and therefore there was never order. There was never an order by the trial court, and therefore there's nothing we can do. Okay, what about the third request? And the third request, remember, the third request was to disqualify the judge. They also put in this petition, this is again, Richard Allen's attorneys, his appellate attorneys, putting into the this petition for a writ of mandamus to, that, the, that the Indiana Supreme Court should order that this special judge be remo removed from the case. So they're completely flipping the script. They're trying to say, you try to uh, disqualify us, we are disqualifying you. And that's what they're trying to do here. And the Indiana Supreme Court on this issue said, no, we are not disqualifying her. Why not? Well, this is what they say. Allen's third request is that we appoint a new special judge to avoid the appearance that the trial court is biased against the defense. And they make an argument. They make an argument. Look, this, this special judge who now we're going to have to appear in, and try this case in front of is obviously going to be biased against us. She's already said to us on numerous occasions that she thinks that we're incompetent. So therefore, there's obviously a bias against us. So, the way that they analyze this is the following. How do you start? How do you start? What's presumptions, right? We have to start with presumptions. Just like a defendant is, has a presumption of innocence. Well, what about here? You have a judge, and the judge seems to have said some things that would seem that she's biased against the, the attorneys. Where's the presumption? So, the Indiana Supreme Court said the following. We begin with the presumption that a trial judge is unbiased. And this is straight out from a case, straight from a case, that the presumption is that a trial judge is unbiased. We have to give them the benefit of the doubt that they're really starting off as unbiased, right? Why should a person, why should a judge be automatically biased against somebody? And then they say the following. To overcome that presumption, which is also, this is a quote straight out of a case, to overcome that presumption, the party seeking disqualification must identify facts reflecting the judge's actual bias or prejudice. So you've got to identify the facts. Where are those facts that show that she's biased or prejudiced? Our law is well settled that prejudice is not inferred from adverse judicial ruling, rulings. So just because a judge ruled against you doesn't mean that the judge is biased against you. The judge just feels that she's following the law. So how can we say that this judge is biased? Maybe she feels that, no, I'm protecting Richard Allen's Sixth Amendment rights. So you may think that I'm biased against you. I'm not. I think that you're ineffective. I think that you're incompetent. I think you're grossly negligent. But I'm just trying to follow the law of the Sixth Amendment. There's nothing personal against you. I just happen to think that you're incompetent. And therefore, I need to protect Richard Allen's Sixth Amendment rights. No doubt that adverse ruling was significant. So here you have the, court, the, the case law says clearly that prejudice is not going to be inferred from an adverse judicial ruling. So the Indiana Supreme Court is saying the following. No doubt that adverse ruling was significant. This, certainly the ruling here by the judge that they're disqualified is significant. But nothing in the record suggests the special judge's decisions emerge from bias or prejudice against Allen. This is not bias or prejudice against Allen. Just the opposite. The special judge expressed explained that she disqualified counsel because she was trying to protect Allen's right to the effective assistance of counsel. That is the excuse that she gave, or that's the reason that she gave. The reason that she gave that she was disqualifying Baldwin and Rossi is because she was protecting Richard Allen's Sixth Amendment rights to effective assistance of counsel. So that's an adverse ruling, you're right, and significant, but she's just trying to follow the Sixth Amendment. Though we've determined 
Listen to what they say here. Though we've determined the record does not support her disqualification decision, we reached that conclusion with the benefit of weeks to consider the issue, thorough briefing and oral argument from excellent appellate attorneys, and the benefit of five justices and their staffs poring over the record, authorities, and arguments. The special judge did not have those luxuries. So they're saying, even though we disagree with her, but we were in a much better place. We had so much more hands, so much more resources, and we had such excellent appellate briefing on this matter. So that's why. That's why we are saying that she made a mistake, but we're still going to let her save face because she obviously didn't have all these resources. Nor does Allen point to anything suggesting the special judge is biased against Baldwin and Razi. Of course, she said their mistakes reflected gross negligence. Well, what about that? She said that they're grossly negligent, and she was concerned their representation was ineffective. But judicial remarks, listen to this. This is taken straight from a case, this quote. But judicial remarks during the course of a trial that are critical or disapproving of or even hostile, hostile to the parties or their cases ordinarily do not support a bias or partiality challenge. So that's just because the judge said something critical of you does not automatically show that she's biased against you. She's giving her opinion, perhaps, and she's being critical, but that doesn't, that doesn't rise to show you that she's biased. That is, listen to this, this is also straight from the opinion. That is, unless they reveal an opinion that derives from an extrajudicial source. So there's, if they say an opinion in court, which, for example, if they would say, Baldwin and Razi, you're grossly negligent because I spoke to some of your previous clients and they told me that you're terrible and you have a hor- and you're, just, you're just a horrible person. You're a horrible lawyer. That's an extrajudicial comment. And that's, then you can show bias by the, by the judge saying something like that. And here, the statements, instead, her statements were based entirely on her, on her observations within this case. So here, these are not extra judicial statements where she got this idea that they're grossly negligent. It's directly from conduct that she saw that happened in this case. And therefore, it's not extra judicial comments or statements. It's actually what she observed and saw in this case. And that's why the Indiana Supreme Court said, no, she is going to stay on the case. And like I said in my last video, this is going to be a very interesting trial. You've got to watch this in case you weren't going to watch this trial before. Maybe you weren't into this trial, but now it's just the drama is going to be unbelievable because you have these are lawyers and you have this judge, this special judge who is, they obviously are not going to be best friends here. And she thinks that they're completely incompetent. She tried to disqualify them. They're trying the case. They're trying the case in front of her. They're going to be making objections. They're going to be making motions. And any time that she's going to rule against them, there's just going to be such tension in that courtroom. So you've got to watch this trial when it goes down. So that is breaking apart the uh, opinion of the Indiana Supreme Court in the Richard Allen case. And we will see when this trial actually gets set. May not, it may still be within 70 days. We don't know. We'll see what happens. And they're going to probably file that motion for a speedy trial. They're ready. And they're ready to try this case. So we will see what happens when the trial is going to be scheduled. That's it for now. Please, if you haven't liked, subscribe, like the video, and we will see you next time.